thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence my life. Be thou my wisdom and thou my true word. I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, I thy true Son. Thou in me dwelling. I with thee one Be thou my battle shield sword for my fight Be thou my dignity thou my delight Thou my soul shelter, Thou my high tower. Raise Thou me heavenward, O power of my power. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou and Thou only first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure Thou art. High King of Heaven, my victory won. May I reach Heaven's joys, O bright Heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O of all still be my vision O ruler of all Good morning church Everybody here come to worship the Lord this morning Let's do that this morning with all our heart Let's give him our best. Let's lift him up. Yeah. 
Shall we begin with prayer today? I want to say something. When you come here, I want you to always know and be reminded that you are free and forgiven. I don't care what you've done this week. I don't care what you've done this year. I don't care what you've done. The worst thing in your life, in Jesus Christ, there is no sin. There's no mistake. There's no shame. There's no grief that's not completely forgiven because he died on the cross. He paid the ultimate price that covered it all for us. Amen? Amen. So let those things go. Doesn't mean we keep doing it. We're not, Paul says, do we keep on sinning because we've been forgiven? Heck no. In fact, that's about the, the language is about that strong. Heck no. We allow Christ to come into our lives. So receive his forgiveness today, but that forgiveness is designed for us to become better Christians. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for being with us today. We thank you for songs this morning that remind us of the truth of your grace and goodness, that you are our vision. Lord, that all the goals that we might have in our lives, we might have worthy goals. It might be uh, to buy a first car or a first home. It might be to get our kids to college somehow, or it might be the goal of a, of a different job or position. Those are important things, but the ultimate vision is Jesus Christ. Be thou my vision, that we would be like him in all that we do. So we pray this morning for your blessings upon us, and we receive from you the forgiveness that comes because Jesus Christ came and lived and was, was arrested and tortured and died for our sins. The only one worthy of that place is Jesus because he was perfect. Your word says that uh, he was tempted in every way that we are tempted, yet without sin. Because of that perfection, he is a worthy sacrifice. May we receive that this morning, not leave here feeling guilty about anything, but at the same time have the conviction in heart to receive his grace and strength and faith that we might be better men and women. Be with us this morning, Lord. Be with those that could not be with us this morning. Be exalted in this little church, we pray in your name. All God's people have said loudly together. Amen. Amen. Please have a seat. Welcome, Pastor Richard. Good morning, FAC. God is good. Mm. 
and all the time. If you have a bulletin, uh, there's this awesome little thing in there that uh, is our vision and our mission statement here at FAC. And the past week, um, our church board, our church worship team, we've been kind of uh, hounding it a little bit because it's really important whether you're a corporation, a nonprofit, uh, or just a church body, that you have a vision, you have a direction, right? A vision is where are we trying to to get? What's our ultimate goal and purpose here as a church? And so we have one, and we don't talk about it enough. So one thing that I want to do for the next couple weeks is share our vision, repeat it over, and then I want to go over our mission. And our mission statement actually has four separate steps. And what I want to do is spend the next four weeks talking in this moment of word of encouragement about each of those individual steps and how we can live that out. Because if you complete the mission... The vision also gets accomplished, okay? So here's our vision statement. If you have your bulletin, it should be in there. Our vision is to make followers of Jesus who live out and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in our communities and the world. I'm going to say it one more time. Our vision is to make followers of Jesus Christ who live out and proclaim the gospel of Jesus in our community and our world. That's a pretty good vision, yeah? Can we all get behind the idea of actually like making Christians, (laughs) followers of Jesus, right? If you're saying, no, I don't want any more Christians in heaven, maybe you should check yourself, right? We want more believers. That is our vision statement. That's what our goal here at FAC is. And so... We have a mission statement that ties with that. And again, if we can focus on the mission, the mission is what we do day in and day out, this will get taken care of, okay? Because that's a big deal, trying to make Christ followers. That's a huge vision and mission. Uh, But here's here's our mission statement. It says, through God's grace, Christ's sacrifice, and the power of the Holy Spirit, our mission is to, and here's week one of this journey, build intentional relationships with new non-Christians and unchurched families. Through God's grace, Christ's sacrifice, and the power of the Spirit, our mission is to build intentional relationships with new non-Christian and unchurched families. What's significant about that? We're not trying to steal Christians from other churches. This is not a battle. This is not a tug-of-war. We are one church, right? We're one church. We're one body, many members, okay? I pray for every church here in Ferndale. I pray for churches in Whatcom County. I'm not, it's not my mission to steal Christians from other churches so our church grows. Our mission is to find non-Christians in our workplaces, in our families, help them find Christ and bring them to a church family. It's also to find those Christians that aren't plugged into a church family, and it's to bring them here. That's our mission. So how do we do this? I want to give you just one little thing. This is 2 Timothy chapter 15, and it goes like this. It says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed of who correctly handles the word of truth. We should not be ashamed of the Bible. We should not be ashamed of what God has given us. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. I'm going to use a youth group analogy here. When we're going out and reaching the unsaved, right, the lost, it's really dangerous for us to go into a group and try and save the whole group. Okay, it goes like this. Let me see. I want to pick on somebody. Uh, I don't know. Who do I want to pick on? Chloe, you come up here. So imagine me, Mr. Christian. I'm going to try and save Chloe. So come stand right here. So Chloe, right, she is into the ungodly chatter. Sorry, Chloe's really not. We love Chloe, okay? (laughs) She's in the ungodly chatter. Now I'm here by myself, okay? And my goal is I'm going to go save Chloe. You're going to pull me, and I'm going to pull you. Ready? Go. Who's going to win this fight every time? Chloe. Chloe. Now, Tom, you're my brother in Christ. Come here. Pick a 
strongest guy in church. <laughs> now, Tommy and I are going to do this together. I don't even need two hands. Ready? Fight. <laughs> Who's going to win? Right? The point I'm trying to make, you guys are dismissed, thank you. The point I'm trying to make is too often we go into our workplaces, we go into our families, and we think we're the hero. We think we have to do it. We think it's my mission to save the ungodly. It is, but it takes a group. It takes at least two people intentionally focusing on those people. So when you're in church, when you're at work and you have a Christian brother or sister in Christ, when you're in your family and there's a couple of you who are Christians, work together. My example is this. I created a softball team for fall ball. You guys know I'm addicted, okay? I have three brothers in Christ on that team. The rest of the team are atheists, and they are wild, okay? These are riffraff. I talk with my two other Christian brothers. There's three of us, right? And I say, this is who we're praying for. This is who we're going after. This is who we're loving. And when we do it together, we're going to pull that person up. And it's one at a time, and it's a slow process. But I promise you, church, if you really want to accomplish this mission, and you do it alone, you're going to fail. But if we as a church body get together, talk, and strategize, we will win souls for Christ. Amen? Amen. God is good all and all the time. Okay, we have some fun stuff going on. Youth group tonight, 545 per usual. Also, men's and women's group is going on. They're going into chapter 3, the men's group, uh, doing some theology training. It's an amazing book. I think they're talking about the Holy Spirit, so it's a big one. Get you here. Uh, Tuesdays, women's groups, same time on Tuesdays. Also, something really fun that the worship team's doing, and I'm taking the youth kids, is on Thursday this week, Christ the King Bellingham is doing an all-community worship event. So they're inviting everyone over to Bellingham Christ the King at 7 o'clock on Thursday. It's going to be about an hour and a half of worship experience. There's a guest speaker there. I forget her name. Um, what's that? Willow. You know. Perfect. Thank you, Anna. So uh, Willow, she'll be pre- uh, speaking and teaching there uh, on that worship night. But we're going as a youth group. The, wor- the worship team has decided they're all going to go. Um, and we would love for the rest of the church to go there just to worship God for an hour and a half together, not just as our church, like Little C, but the Big C church, right, the whole community. So get yourself plugged in there. Um, We'll have the offertorians come forward. I believe that's all the offerings, uh, announcements I have. Um, We're going to go ahead and pray, and then the worship team's going to come back up. We're going to continue to worship our good God. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you just so much for this church, Lord. I thank you for the vision and mission that you implanted in John and Diane's heart when they first came here to Ferndale to to really serve you, Lord. Lord, I pray that this church can be a church that's focused on accomplishing that. Lord, we don't want to be a church that just showed up on Sundays, worshiped, went home, checked the box, and moved on. No, we want to be a church that's relentlessly pursuing you and relentlessly pursuing the lost sheep. Lord, I want heaven to be full to the brim. I know it's infinite in its space and we'll never feel like it's crowded, but I want it, Lord. I want every single person in this community, in this world, to have a personal relationship with you, not just for the sake of heaven, but because we know of the peace that comes when we have you here on earth. Lord, let us accomplish this mission. Let us relentlessly pursue you and hear our praises now. In Jesus' name, amen. In the morning, when I rise, in the morning, when I rise, in the morning, when I rise, just give me Jesus, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus Cause you can have all this world Just give me Jesus When I am alone When I am alone oh when i am alone just give me jesus give me jesus
have all this world Just give me Jesus that I 
I can find And all my soul needs Is all your love To cover me So all the world can see I have nothing Take my time on this earth and let it glorify all that you are worth. For I have nothing, I am nothing without you. Gracious Lord and God, thank you that we can be here today to look at your word together. Lord, we believe in this amazing book, 66 books actually that were brought together that were written by people, humans, in real situations, real historical events, real experiences of your people, sometimes good, oftentimes bad. And commentary was written that was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes those words are directly quoted from you. And sometimes they're inspired by the people that wrote these letters and books. And we thank you for this amazing story of the start of the church. Very remarkable. It's, it, it's hard to explain it apart from miracle. Apart from your divine pleasure and participation and design that these 12 disciples went around Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts, to start churches. And then along the way came Paul, a late convert who was hostile, antagonistic, bitter towards Christianity, thinking that it corrupted Judaism. And he was miraculously converted on the road to Damascus. And his life is so remarkable that he, out of his experience of seeing the resurrected Christ, became filled with the Holy Spirit, spent time in the desert studying and learning, and then going out to start churches, starting lots of churches. Lord, he ended up being sort of the senior pastor emeritus of these churches, and then he'd write letters to them. Today, we're finishing the second letter to the church at Thessalonica. There was one letter written. This was probably the second letter was probably written just a few months after. There's such a close relationship of concerns and events that it seems like they were one right after the other. And as we finish it today, Lord, we will be challenged in our own Christian walk in life. So bless us today as we look at your word. May people hear beyond the preacher's words. <laughs> And hear the words of the Spirit speaking to our hearts, speaking directly to us so that when we leave here, we're challenged, we're comforted, and we're inspired to grow. And we pray this today all in your name. Amen. Thank you. And please be seated. We occasionally have to manage adult topics, right? It's just what we do here. We have children's church for that purpose. And today we're going to cover... Not a popular subject, it's a four-letter word, which I'll use in a moment, but I want you to hang in there with me. It's not something we like to talk about, it's not something we like to do, it's not something we want to think that we're going to have to do the rest of our lives, but it is the word work. And so my main point, what I want to convince you of today, and I left it out of your sermon title, if you have, if you have sermon notes this morning in back, I do think it's worth picking those up, it helps you. Uh, follow through, is that work is exceedingly honorable. Think about that for a moment, because we tend to flee work, right? We tend to want to get out of it. We scheme sometimes from day one of employment that I am just shooting for retirement, <laughs> okay, right? That is the goal, and I am unsure, frankly, if that's a biblical goal. If I said, well, let's do a Let's do a men's Bible study or a ladies' Bible study on the subject of retirement. 
Where would you go to in Scripture to promote a position? Now, now, now there are lots of Scriptures dealing with stewardship, you know, and, and saving and things like that, and being generous and not going into debt. No problem with that. But the idea that there's a point in life where we just stop doing er anything that has the word work attached to it, I'm not sure if I find that anywhere in Scripture. So I'm hoping today, using really a powerful set of scriptures from both 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, convince, you, convince all of us that work is exceedingly honorable, okay? Do you mind saying that with me, even if you don't believe me yet? <laughs> work is exceedingly honorable. Let's say it again. Work is exceedingly honorable. It's a good thing. Think about it for a second, just in terms of just basic nuts and bolts. Work means, if you're employed, that you have something of value that you're able to do or give or provide a service, and that somebody's willing to what? Pay you for it. That is pretty cool. I, I, seldomly, I, you could probably think of examples, and I actually looked up some earlier today in terms of I hate to say this because both of my parents were school teachers and we have school teachers here, but there are school districts that pay teachers not to teach. They, 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 they had been determined to be not capable in the classroom, but because of their contracts and because of uh, union protections, they, they actually meet and have coffee all day. And some of these teachers have been teachers for years. So that's kind of an outlier and hopefully none of us fall in that category. But if we're doing something we are bringing value to someone else. And I thought about this myself at times. You know, what if, you know, whatever job it is that we find ourselves in, I've had lots of jobs. How many of you have had at least 10 jobs in your life? Yeah, the goal is to work as hard as you can as unto your employer, the scriptures tell us, unto the Lord. And that mindset is really important that I'm doing something to please God because it's bringing value to one of his children that are paying for the service, whatever that service is. Our goal, and I tell my kids this, I've been telling my, my children this since they were little, that you need to be the most valuable employee that your employment has. You are the indispensable one. You're the last one they would even consider letting go which was important at one time when the economy had high unemployment. It currently doesn't currently have that. But to be the most valuable employee that they have. That's what it means to work on to the Lord. So, that, and by the way, that passage, um, I believe is in Colossians chapter 3. I don't remember the exact number. It's somewhere in the 20s. Colossians chapter 3. Whatever you do, work as unto the Lord. And I believe the context there is Paul is speaking to slaves. Now, how many of you, sometimes it feels like slavery, right? In a sense, it does because, you know, you have to go in. You have to do it. Sometimes you have jobs where you have no choice. It's the only job available currently, and you have a family to take care of. You've got bills to pay, so it becomes a bit of a burden. But I want us to change our mindset today that although I think retirement's a great thing, and I got some concluded remarks about what retirement should look like for God's people, because I think it should be different, but I also want us to be blessed that if we have jobs, we have work, we're able to provide value to somebody and get paid for it. We are exceedingly blessed, and work is exceedingly honorable. Now, there's a background here. Paul has written two letters to this church at Thessalonica. The first letter was a little bit longer. It was five chapters, and it covered a number of issues. Two of those issues emerge again in 2 Thessalonians, telling me that they didn't get it right the first time, which I take kind of comfort in that, you know, sometimes we can teach somebody, maybe it's a church, maybe it's a Bible study, maybe it's our own family, our children, and we teach something over and over again, and they still don't quite get it. Thank you. You knew it was coming, didn't you? <laughs> You must be a parent. <laughs> Gosh, we got you beat. <laughs> got you beat seven. Thank you, though. God bless you. We have to do it again. So Paul is teaching them. Uh, and the two issues are um, the end time stuff. In, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, there's a lot of end times. Jesus is coming back, the rapture, things like that. And he's teaching them these things. It's really some foundational teaching for us. If you kind of need a go-to passage about end-time stuff, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 
But then he comes back in 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter, he has to correct some things because some people were running around saying, Jesus has already come back, and you missed it. And we talked about like missing the boat, <laughs> missing the plane, missing the ride, like you, how you feel when that happens. <laughs> so, not good. I remember one time, I've never told this story before, but when I was a freshman in, in, in high school, I was so proud to be part of the West Bremerton High School marching band. And uh, the West Bremerton High School marching band, band tag was the pride of Puget Sound. Okay, it's pretty cool. And the director of the Pride of Puget Sound, before I got there, and he just had moved to the University of Washington, became the director of the Husky marching band, Bill Bissell. So our high school marching band had a great legacy and great heritage. And I remember my first ever event, it was a trip, was to Seattle from Bremerton was, was um, we were in the Sea Fair Parade. I think it was what it was called, Sea Fair? Is that what it was? Sea Fest? Sea Fair? Sea Fair. Every year there was a parade. And there were actually two parades. There was a Friday night parade called the Torchlight Parade, and then the Saturday day. And our band always won. We, were, we had just a terrific, kind of like Ferndale was for a number of years, a great march of it, large. We had all the stuff, the sousaphones, the saxophones. I would play a thing called a mellophone, which basically was a straightened out French horn. And we were in this, uh, and we always won this thing, which led us to be invited to go to the Rose Parade down in Portland. It was a big deal. I was in my first ever Seafair parade, and I, we took the bus over, and I had to go to the bathroom. I think I was just really nervous. So I found a bathroom somewhere, and then I got out of the bathroom, I looked around, and there was nobody on the ferry boat. And I ran downstairs, and the bus that had the band, the band director, all the instruments and stuff was just leaving the ferry. And I go, this is not good. I mean, all sorts of thoughts were in my mind because, because I was in a spot. I mean, and we were toward the front. You know, they always had the trombones in the front. That's what a trombone player looks like. Put your two fingers there, do this, everybody. Trombone time, okay? Anybody played the trombone younger? Oh, I, say, I love the trombone. But behind the trombone players with a French horn, mellophone player. So I was toward the front, and it would be conspicuous that the band was missing somebody. And missing somebody probably would likely mean the band would lose its uh, standing. So the bus is taken off, and there's no possible way to catch up with it. I'm in my band uniform, by the way. And our uni you, know, you, you know a band uniform. You look kind of out of place. And what do you do? I was lost. I was lost. I was hopeless. I was like, first of all, now where do I go? <laughs> you know, to stay on the ferry boat? Go back to Bremerton, where it came from, an hour on the other side? And I hear this voice. My salvation. My savior. John, get in the car. <laughs> it was a band parent. Now, to this day, I don't remember who it was. And I should, because now it's a great story. And she says, get in the car. So I said, I'm in the car. <laughs> and we raced and followed those buses up the road to the start of the parade. And amazingly, somebody had grabbed my instrument and taken it off the bus. Now, this is before cell phones. So nobody's calling, hey, we got John. OK, I'll get the French horn. I have no idea what made somebody think to grab my instrument. But they were on the bus where I sat. And I was not there, but my French horn was there. And I thought, well, let's just grab that French horn <laughs> and do it. So. I managed to be in the parade. And what did that story have anything to do with my message today? I don't remember. <laughs> but you don't want to miss the bus. That's what happened. This church, this church was being told, you missed the bus. Jesus came and went, and you missed it out. But the other issue really takes up a lot more ink, I think, if I were to count word count, is this issue of work. And they were probably tied together because there were Christians who quit working for who knows the number of reasons. First, it's a very appealing position to quit working, right? I mean, who wants to work if you don't have to? Probably they thought that Jesus was going to come back within the week with a month. See the tie in there? And they thought he's coming back. And we have seen that in modern times. People joining cults that go off in the mountains and people sell everything they have and give it to some crazy nutcase damned cult leader who takes their money 
drags them off to the middle of nowhere, and sometimes they completely disappear, and who knows. A lot of times they commit mass suicide, all sorts of terrible things, because they don't want to miss out. So Paul's concerned about both issues, the issue of working, and to keep working, even though Jesus may come back at any time. We talked about that tension. We talked about a number of tensions theologically. One of them is this. Jesus could come back before we got the final song song today. Right? Right? Are you ready, by the way? <laughs> Whenever I say something like that, I think I'm ready, Lord. Okay, yeah. You have your trust and faith in Jesus. Or he could come back later. We've had the, I think the awesome, especially with being able to understand history and, and look back, 2,000 years of watching the spread of Christianity around the world. I think it's amazing. Okay, so what we're going to do now, we're going to touch bases with two little sections of First Thessalonians that deal with the issue of work. And then we're going to jump to our final sermon of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 to wrap this up and see that this is the final thing that Paul wanted to speak to them about. So if you have a set of sermon notes, you'll see these scriptures have been provided for you. But I'm in 1 Thessalonians now, chapter 2, verse 9. Paul says, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and our hardship. Immediately, Paul is referencing that they worked. That wasn't easy for them. That we, the we going back to verse, chapter 1, verse 1, Silas and Timothy, we worked. We didn't vacation. We didn't relax, but we worked. And then what does it say next? Well, oh, thank you. Night and day. I know it's a Cole Porter tune. <laughs> night and day, you are the one. No, night and day we worked in order to what? Not be a burden to anyone. While we preach the gospel to you, Paul was what we, in our in our language, they call bivocational. Bivocational ministry people are very common. They are extremely common. Uh, at least 25% of pastors are bivocational. I think it's actually more than that by now, but there are a lot who have some side hustle going on to make things work. Paul did, and he made tents. Because he didn't want to be a burden while they preached the gospel of God to you. And then we jump to... Um, Chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians. I'm going to start at verse 9. It said, beautiful. Set of words. Now, about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. So they, they were supporting, obviously, uh, missionary evangelistic work in that region of Greece. Yet, in spite of all that you're doing, we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. So if you think you're doing well, watch out, because God might send a messenger and say, you're doing great. Now do more. But I'm doing this much. Great. Now do more. <laughs> How many of you here can truly say you're doing enough for the kingdom? Can we see? <laughs> Sorry, I got you. <laughs> You're forgiven. <laughs> we can do more. He'll show us how to be more efficient and do more. And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Quiet is not silence of the ears. And it's, it's more, it has the idea of being at peace with people. And then I like this next passage, which takes a little bit of explanation because it's misunderstood. I'm in verse, second half of verse 11. You should mind your own business. And work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders. And can we just say here real quick, there's nothing that kills your witness more towards your, towards your fellow employees than to be a bad worker, right? Can we, we know this, right? That if you're the, the, the weak link, the lazy person, the one that's cutting hours short, the one that comes late, the one that uh, is mismanaging responsibilities, don't even open your mouth. Just pretend you're not a Christian, okay? It would be better. Because he says here that your daily life might win the respect of outsiders and so that they will not, and that you're not to be dependent on anybody. 
And this theme of working to provide for yourself and your family comes up again. But I want to provide a caution on one set of words here, and I've done this before because it's so easily misunderstood. When Paul says, mind your own business, there's a literal, there's a literal meaning to that phrase, mind your own business. That's important and accurate and part of this verse. And then there's a secondary cultural meaning to mind your own business. The first one says this, you mind, you focus upon, you take care of your business. Right? Pretty simple. My, and, it, and he's literally, this is a good translation, take care of your responsibilities. Namely, take care of your family. Make sure that you're providing for you and your loved ones. The secondary cultural meaning that's not part of the verse, it's not biblical, is and don't mind other people's business, right? So when we say, mind your own business, we're usually saying something different. We're saying, don't mind mine. Understand that? The phrase has been kind of co-opted over the years to mean something that was never meant biblically. Because we are our brother's keeper. We do have, you wouldn't even have books of the New Testament unless we were to have concern about other people. This, these two letters are concerns about the behavior or lack of behavior of Christians. Paul is minding the business of other people by encouraging them to mind their business. It's never meant, it does not literally say in the Greek or in the English even, frankly, that you're not concerned about how other people are living their lives. Christianity is a concern about how people in our realm of influence live their lives. Otherwise, why do we share Jesus? Why do we exhort people? Why do we encourage people in their lives, in their relationships, in their marriage? And people oftentimes say, mind your own business. Well, I do. <laughs> but I'm also concerned about yours. Do you understand that? It, it, it's one of those unfortunate colloquialisms and phrases that has been changed. Uh, but it's not in the English. And it's not even in the Greek. And if it was, it would be something like, mind your own business and stay out of the business of everybody else doesn't say that. Okay, having said that, we go on, chapter 5, and there's a phrase here that repeats itself twice in the next letter, word for word. First, first Thessalonians 5.14, and we urge you, brothers and sisters, to warn those who are, are idle and disruptive. We see that phrase, idle and disruptive, I believe, if I recall from this memory, that it shows up twice in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. It makes us wonder, are there two different things going on here? Okay, I want you to warn the idle. We get that. Those that are not carrying the load. And in this situation, it may be a church that's, that's collecting money, collecting food, providing housing, doing things, and some may be taking advantage of it. Healthy people who could be participating in providing are just uh, taking. They're takers, they're not givers or sharers. And that would be the idol. But then it mentions another group of people who are called the disruptive. They're disrupting things. And it could be one of several things. The two main, the two, the two main um, candidates would be, these are people who are just, they don't get along very well. And they're causing problems, and they're being divisive, and they're sharing things that don't make sense, and their theology is goofed up. They're, they're dividing the church. Or it could be the same group of people who are not working. And I can see how people not working, not carrying their load, would be disruptive to a church. It's like, how come this guy comes in and you know, picks up the free steaks and the free burgers and stuff like that, but he's, he's not bringing anything in with them? That would be disruptive to this church. So we got this thing going on of people not doing their work. And then Paul hears about this church that it has not been solved. And that's, I guess, it may be a bit encouraging to those of us in the, are in teaching roles. Sometimes we teach things that just didn't quite connect. We just keep teaching it again. But this time, Paul kind of lays it on a heavier, okay? It's heavy duty in 2 Thessalonians. So we're going to finish today by going through chapter 3, 2 Thessalonians, verses 6 to the end of the chapter. That'll wrap things up. And just notice the strength and passion but the common themes that we've just covered from 1 Thessalonians. So, chapter 3, verse 6, 2 Thessalonians. He begins by saying, In the name 
of the Lord Jesus Christ, which Paul does a lot. I, this is not Paul. It's not Titus. This is not Silas. This is Jesus Christ who has a message for us. And then he uses a military term here, by the way. That we command you. We order you. You need to stand at attention here. This is actually a word that's used in military context. Brothers and sisters, and then get this, to keep away from every believer who is idle. That seems a little harsh, doesn't it? Right? I mean, that should get our attention, especially if they're close to us. We should stay away from every believer who is idle. And the language here suggests it's not that we shun people. That's not a biblical concept. That's a distortion of what's going on. It's that they're not brought into maybe the more intimate circles of our lives and ministry. They would not be people you'd want to put in a leadership capacity in your church or in your business or things like that. To keep away from them, to separate them, understand they're not carrying their weight. And by having them participate in significant leadership positions is not going to help your organization. Certainly not going to help the church. So keep away from every believer who is idle. And there's also a practical aspect. I think parents are like this too. When we are aware of uh, people that are children that are of ages of our, of our kids and they're looking at peer groups and friendships and things like that, that we want them to stay away from the bad examples because bad company corrupts good morals. Somewhere in Corinthians we read that. So you want to be careful who you hang out with. It's not good. If you're, you know, if you're an employee of a company, high-powered, hard-working company, hang out with the hard-working people. It might rub off on you. <laughs> you hang out with the not-so-hard-working, the idle people, you have a greater chance of following that path and finding yourself collecting an unemployment check. So keep away from, the, from every believer who's idle and disruptive. So my point here is that same, those same two words are here. Idle and disruptive. Paul brings them together. I think there, there's a combination here that people who are idle, by their very nature, passive nature, become an object of ridicule and controversy and dislike, and that in and of itself becomes disruptive. Those that are disruptive and do not live according to the teaching that we have received from us, obviously the teaching about not being idle. For you yourselves know, I'm in verse 7, how you ought to follow our example. And that's when I want to go back to um, chapter 2 of the first book where he says, I, we work day and night. We were an example to you. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked, here we go, same words, night and day, laboring and toiling so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we did not have a right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. Paul is making it very clear that they had a right to support as preachers, pastors, missionaries, but to be a good example to this church that had a work ethic challenge, they worked day and night. Um, Paul fleshes that out a little bit in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the obligation towards those who are in service, in ministry service. And I'll just read it to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 starts with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 7. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Rhetorical question. No one. Who plants a vineyard and does not eat its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink the milk? Do I say this merely on a human level? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses... Do not muzzle an ox while it's trading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is really concerned about? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us because whoever plows and threshes should also be able to share in the hope of the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? Financial material. This is what Paul says to the Corinthian church. If others have this right of support, shouldn't we have it as well? But we didn't use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than being a hinder, a hinder to the gospel of Christ. 
Because don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple? And he's, of course, using the easiest illustration they could think of before the church was organized and established, the, the Jewish religion. And that those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar. So you're participating in this service that, that brings in sacrifices and animals and fresh, high quality, the best meat, that those who are offering the sacrifices as priests and such participate. And then the money shot is in verse 14. In the same way, as animals are animals allowed to eat when they're threshing, um, as um, the priests are benefiting from the sacrifice, in the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. But there are times, and there are a lot of times, when that doesn't happen for their different reasons. And in Paul's case, it was his choice so as to be an example of what hard work looked like. So nobody could criticize him to say, you're just in it. You're just in it, Paul, for the money. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. We gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. That's tough. That's tough. If we know somebody, we know somebody who's capable of working. And some people aren't sometimes. And we... That's a whole different issue. But are capable of working and there's work available and they choose not to? Scripture says they shouldn't eat. And these things get terribly complicated, especially when there are families and children involved. But the principle is still the same, that those who can work ought to do something. I had a friend who was very skilled in high tech. In fact, he had his own software company at one time. And things didn't work out very well, and, and he was unemployed. And I said to my friend, you know, if I were you, I would just take anything and see what God will do. Because you do have a family you have to take care of. Just take anything. So he became a cashier at the local convenience store here in town. It wasn't three months before he had a job that he kept and had and advanced in for the rest of his career and retired well. And I, we, he, I'll talk about that. That it was, you know, I needed to do something. Something that was even below my skill set. But I needed to do something to take care of my family. And God bless that. Verse 11. We hear that some among you are, here we go, same words, idle and disruptive. I think that's three times we've seen that. They're not busy. They're busy bodies. That's actually pretty close to the Greek. They're not busy. They're busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the food they eat. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing good. I love that because my mind quickly goes to one of my favorite New Testament passages. Never tire of good, doing good. Because whether we're dealing in ministry issues or just life issues, you know, paying the rent, paying the mortgage, raising our families. Anybody ever get tired? <laughs> it, it tires them. Paul gets it. And so I'm going I'm to read one of my favorite six verses. Galatians chapter 6, I should say. I love this passage. It, it covers the gamut of, of, of getting tired in ministry and working hard and and dealing with people that aren't very together and what to do with them. There's a lot here. I'm not going to unpack it, but I'm just going to read it because it's so helpful. Brothers and sisters, I'm in Galatians 6. If somebody is caught in sin, you, it doesn't say the pastor, it doesn't say the elder, it just says you, <laughs> whoever is aware of this, who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. Led by the Spirit, this is, you have a spiritual life. If you don't have a spiritual life, don't be involved with restoration, and you should do it gently. Gently because, you know, there but for the grace of God, go I. But watch yourselves, or you may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Now, if anybody thinks they are something, I'd never do that. When they are not, they deceive themselves. But each one should test their own actions. Make sure... You know, Jesus, Jesus is saying it differently when he, says, when he says, you know, judge not lest ye be judged. <laughs> Check yourself out first. 
They should, test, they should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. And what he means there is that we should never think of ourselves. The best people that bring correction to others are those that recognize they've done worse and could do worse. For each one of you should carry their own law. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. So there's a quick little reminder, Paul, to take care of those who are teaching and leading over you. And then do not be deceived, verse 7. God can't be mocked. A man reaps what he sows, and whoever sows to please their flesh, well, from the flesh reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will receive eternal life. And then the, the key verse, let us not become weary. I, I think Paul probably wrote this when he felt weary. Let us not become weary in doing good. Keep your eye on the prize. Keep your eye on the vision. Keep your eye on the mission. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. All people meaning believers, non-believers, because he says the next thing. I want you to do good for all people. Whoever's in your realm and orbit and circle, work, family, neighbor, whatever, but especially those who belong to the family of believers. Finishing up, chapter 3, verse 14. Paul says, I want you to take special note of anyone who does not obey our instructions in this letter. Again, he's repeating himself. Do not associate with them. Don't, don't let them believe they're, all, they're on the inside. You know, it's, you know don't, don't mislead them that they're part of the crowd, part of the leadership core, part of the, the significant ministry part of your organization when they're not carrying their load. Don't associate with them does not mean you shun them. In fact, we just read that you're supposed to love them. But we separate them to a degree for one reason, that they might feel ashamed. That's what it says. <clears throat> Do not associate with them in order that they might feel ashamed. Now, I don't like shame, but sometimes there's a godly purpose to shame. If it's understood correctly, it's like, wait a minute, I feel some shame here. Maybe there's a reason. Now, a lot of shame is, is past choice induced, and the evil one, that's, that's something different. But sometimes we are living a course in life. In this case, we're not providing for our family, and we could be, and we should be, and yes, we should feel ashamed. And that shame should lead us to, Paul says of grief in 2 Corinthians, to lead us to repentance. Make a change in our lives. Yet do not regard them as an enemy. There we go. We're not going to shun them. We're not going to regard them as an enemy. We're going to let a little shame work so that they'll bring some change in their lives. And you need to warn them as you would a fellow believer. So we, the next three verses wrap up the letter, but I just want to make a couple comments on the subject of work and retirement, things like that. First thing, it is the duty of the church for, to provide, if it can, a living wage for its pastors, especially those who preach. We increasingly find ourselves, and you can look this up to see more and more pastors, and, and they're handling this differently. And I meet with pastors all the time, and I hear different stories. They handle their bivocational. They got a, a side hustle going on to help things out. Or they've inherited a business. I know one pastor who, who inherited a nut farm, another, another pastor who inherited part of a hotel uh, in Hawaii. And so those are supplemental incomes. That's not an uncommon thing, to have some kind of inheritance that provides some kind of income. Pastors have spouses who work. Not, it's not uncommon. It's not at all uncommon to have spouses who work who make more money than the pastor. And increasingly, and this is a cool thing, this is an awesome thing. We're seeing pastors, we're seeing men and women who've had a career for 20, 30 years and are able to retire, and then they start a new career. They look ahead and say, you know, I think I've got 30, 40 more years. I want to, I want to build the kingdom of heaven. And that leads to this comment. If you are in the place where you've had the fortune of retiring, kind of a neat part of our Western world, isn't it? That we've had, we've got vehicles for investing, we have social security and things like that, that it's not all that difficult at a certain point to retire. That is the go signal. That's the go signal. That's not the goal signal to 
get on a cruise ship for 10 years in a row, which I just read the other day. <laughs> this couple, super wealthy, they booked a 10-year cruise. 10-year cruises. They're on the same boat, just keep staying on the boat. It was in, it was in the news. <laughs> or to whatever. It's not a go to check out. I would suggest a change of thinking that retirement is, is that time when you can be more engaged in kingdom work than you've ever been before. Right? Why not? What else are you going to do that's going to be worthwhile? How are you going to account for the, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years of non-employment when you, you are able to do more to serve the kingdom of heaven? What is Jesus going to say when he says, what have you done with those 20, 30 years of health I gave you and affluence I gave you and opportunity I gave you? So it's a, the word is go, not go on vacation. Nothing wrong with taking trips and, and, and enjoying the relaxation. But if, you're, if retirement from work and ministry is your goal, you get the wrong goal. The goal is to be capable of spending more time serving the Lord. So finishing up verse 16, and then we finish this book, and then next week we go back to Acts chapter 18, where Paul heads towards Corinth, and a lot of stuff goes on in Corinth. So much so we have two of the largest letters in the New Testament dealing with the church at Corinth. Oddly, there's probably four letters that went to Corinth, but we only have two of them. So Paul finishes up not, not too much different than he does in other books. Now, may the Lord of peace, I, a subtle difference, it's usually, he usually says here God of peace, but here he says Lord of peace, give you peace. Well, that's kind of cool. It's the Lord of peace that gives us peace. And then the next three words, at all times. You know, I, I really do believe that we can have a relationship with God so we can have peace with him at all times. So let me read those words again. Now may the Lord of peace give you peace at all times and in every way. And the Lord be with you. 17, I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand, which is this distinguishing mark in all my letters. This is how I write. Paul usually had a secretary, it's probably Silas, writing his letters out. But there seems to have been a letter sent, purportedly sent from Paul, that got people all mixed up about in time stuff. So Paul must have had a unique signature that was recognized. Can you imagine what that would be worth? <laughs> if we found one of Paul's original letters with his signature on it, his own John Hancock, we don't have it. But he would, he would write to them. And, he would, and we read this in other letters. He would sign letters himself. And, he write, and then once he gets to this point in his letter, he writes the rest of it. It says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So I'd like to say this. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, regardless of your situation in terms of work. If you're able to work, if you don't have to work, if you're going to retire soon, if you're already retired, if you don't even think retirement's a possibility, Work is exceedingly honorable. You persuaded? It is. It's not a curse. I didn't, I didn't mention earlier, but I think you, you know this. Some people, yeah, if that's part of the fall. We have to work. Uh -uh. Work started before the fall. Work was given to man in the garden to till the garden, take care of the garden, and work. The fall just made it more difficult as it made everything else more difficult. Let's pray, and the band comes up, and we'll close with our closing song. Lord, thank you for the privilege of working. Lord, we need to see work as a privilege. It's a combination of physical abilities, mental capacity, training, experiences, background, and Lord, the, the privilege of working, Lord. At the same time, Lord, we, we're also to be good stewards. We are responsible for not getting into debt and to be saving and things like that. These are biblical values. But Lord, whether we achieve two years of retirement or 20 or 40 or 60 years of retirement. We are to maximize all of our time to serve you and put you first in our lives and in our families' lives. So I ask, Lord Jesus, that we would have a different view of work, that we should not see work as a curse or a burden. In fact, Lord, it's, e it's so easy to go to work and complain about our jobs when I wonder if that's half our problem, that we get rid of the complaining be thankful for our managers, our bosses, the place that we work.
And Lord, and that we would see those places as a blessing. I remember the first time it hit me when I, my, my first real job, driving buses for Holland America. And I kind of sat back one day. I liked the work. I'd made good money. I had made enough money not to go into debt at all in my graduate work from working that job. And I realized I didn't buy the cruise ships. I didn't buy the motor coaches. I didn't buy the hotels. As it says in the Old Testament, we didn't build the cities. They were already there. We were just hired because we're really willing and ready to learn, willing to serve people, willing to help people experience the state of Alaska in this case, and, uh, and to, to be paid for it. It was an extraordinary experience. Just personally, I realized that I had other people in my corner wanting me to succeed so they could succeed. So bless us now, Laura, as we wrap up our service together. Thank you that you have turned grades into gardens that you've turned curses into blessings. You've turned sin into salvation. And we thank you for all this in your name. Amen. Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. This man's empty praise, the treasures of fame, but never enough. But you came along, you put me back together. Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. You've seen them all, but you still call me friend. It's the God of the mountain, it's the God of the valley. Mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. There's nothing is better.
just nothing Cause nothing is better than you Oh, there's nothing better than you There's nothing better than you, Lord There's nothing, cause nothing is better all to be grateful and what I mean by that is thanking the Lord for the skills and the gifts that God has given us. Are you ever amazed at some of the things that people are able to do? I don't understand software. How people craft and design software to do the amazing things that we have. How about a cell phone? Somebody had to put that thing together and invent the thing. It's utterly amazing to me the skills that people have. But there's an important passage. It's really important that I think brings us to humility. It's in Deuteronomy 7 or 8, where it says that God gives us the skills and abilities that we have to create wealth, to create things, to make things. It all comes from God's design of us, which is pretty amazing, isn't it? So if you have special skills and, and capabilities in your work and your employment and your business, thank the Lord he's made you that way. Amen? Amen. You guys have a great day today. Thank you for being here. Grab a friend and bring them next.